So what's my job? My job is to uh, discuss business succession planning, exit planning, whatever you want to call it, at really a, a 5,000 foot level so that you can understand the process so that you can think about what the end's going to look like and what are the steps all the way along. So you got a number of presenters this afternoon that are probably going to delve into some of the specific tools and tricks that we use. But realistically, my job is to make sure you guys are, are seeing the forest for the trees. And so many folks get stuck on the trees and a specific document or a specific issue that they lose sight of the entire plan. Does that make sense? OK, so first you got to understand who I am and I guess who I work for. There we go. So this is our tagline. We are Epiphany Law. We're uh, eight attorney consultants and probably 22 total staff. So I guess for this area, a mid-sized firm, but in my mind, a relatively small firm. We are extremely focused. And so we say different. What does that mean? We're focused on business law, business succession, and essentially estate planning. Do a little litigation, have one litigator that supports those areas. But don't do divorce. If you, uh, if you get a ticket tonight on the ride home, don't call me. Um, don't do bankruptcy, don't do that kind of stuff. So very focused. What else is different about us? We take much more of a consultative approach, proactive, as opposed to most law firms that, what, when do you call your lawyer? Sorry, I require audience interaction. <laughs> when do you typically call your lawyer? After there's been a problem, right? You're like, ooh, OK. And then the next time you call them, it's another problem, right? Oftentimes, businesses and, and attorneys, OK, attorneys should shelter the vast majority of the blame, don't take a proactive approach to finding out about the business, finding out about the issues, and addressing them beforehand. So we pride ourselves on doing that. The other thing that we have moved significantly away from is the billable hour model. Why would a business owner have an issue with the billable hour model? Anybody? Because you milk it, right? I mean, any anytime you set up an arrangement where the individual is more inefficient, you pay more. Like, would you do that in the normal marketplace? I mean, probably not. And so, so the vast majority of our pieces, again, it's it's all hard. Um, and you have to get information, and you got to understand what's going on. But if you're able to be focused, you should be able to get from a professional service provider a, OK, I'll give you a little range. But realistically, if you've done this before and you understand the issues, you should be able to get a quote from that individual that they should be able to honor. And so we do that with practically all of our stuff other than litigation. Should work perfectly. This is who I am, because you got to understand the individual. Who they have, everybody has filters, right? So these are my filters. Let's go over them. Um, engineer. What are engineers good at? How do they look at life? Mathematically. Mathematically. Do, they, do, they, do they like predictable results? Do they like defining inputs and outputs? Do they like systems and processes and that kind of stuff? Absolutely. How about the MBA? From right here, UW Oshkosh. Started at Madison, finished it here. What does that mean? Probably means that I take more of a holistic approach, right? I'm a lawyer. Do I, though, think that law is like the only thing important in your business? Probably not, right? Because uh, I've owned a lot of businesses. Roofing companies, post-frame construction companies, banquet hall. Don't own a banquet hall. Anybody own a banquet hall? That's a horrible idea. <laughs> What's that? A yes, publishing company. That was all right. You could do, you could do publishing company. That, that works all right. A lot of real estate. Um, and then, obviously, the law firm. Um, the JD, what does that mean? That's the law degree. Means in general, I'm more of a direct person and fully capable of being an asshole, right? I mean, like, that's what it means. Ask my wife. She's certain of it. 
Um, certified exit planning advisor. I've had that designation for, I don't know, four years, five years, or something like that. First one, um, this side of Milwaukee, Madison, to actually go into and learn and get certified in this business succession stuff. So I've been doing this stuff for a long time. And probably right now, I'd say 90% of my practice is with business owners on defining business succession, a large portion of it being family business owners. And so I think you'll get some good advice. And then I mentioned the business owner piece. Agenda, here's what we're going to cover in the next 50 minutes. We're talking general. What, what, what am I talking about when I say business succession? Well, oftentimes we call it just succession planning. What are the differences? What are the additional things we got to cover in this business succession thing? We're going to talk about the odds. Dean Rao referenced some of them. I think Jason referenced some of them. Um, but we're going to go over those. We're going to go at a very high level business valuation and the impact that planning can have upon business valuation. Is it still early? So we're not going to do a lot of math. Okay, not a lot of math, but just a high level. At the end of the day, if you're going to be paying for and investing time into planning, you want to see an ROI. And you got to understand how that impacts business valuation. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about when to start, at least minimums. Um, and I guess we got critical pieces of the plan in there, kind of from a high level. Does that seem like a reasonable agenda? At my presentations, you are free to ask questions at any time. But I am free to say I'm not going to answer that now, and we'll talk about that one later. Um, certainly, if out of this presentation you come up with personal issues, we have no problem with folks emailing me, calling me, talking to my assistant, and going and having lunch or a beer. Lunch is cheaper for you. If you buy me lunch, it's less money than buying me beer. Um, but I would encourage you not to raise your hand and go, hey, my friend has this problem. Because everybody in the room knows that you're not talking about your friend. You're talking about you. All right, so let's get started. Why are we here? We've all heard about succession planning. But realistically, what, what I heard up here was business succession planning. What's the difference? Does Kimberly Clark need succession planning? Who says yes? Who says no? Nobody said no. So we got a bunch of yeses. What does succession planning mean for Kimberly Clark? Finding the next leadership. Correct. Everybody hear that? That was finding your next leadership. Oftentimes, folks talk about succession planning. What they really mean is they mean leadership succession. But what are the additional issues that a privately held business have to deal with besides leadership succession? They still have to deal with leadership ship succe succession. But what else do they have to deal with? We talked about them. What is it? Ownership, ownership right? Is <laughs> KC got to worry about his ownership? Nope, not really. Publicly traded, right? Like, what else? You got certainly that enormous family dynamic. And you got some dysfunction at KC, right? Sorry, anybody from KC? But you'll oftentimes have additional issues in a family business. The other piece is we're going to find contingency planning. So oftentimes, a privately held business is much more dependent upon an individual, one individual or two individuals or three individuals, particularly in the family context. And so we've got to deal with what happens if something happens. Does that make sense? So you'll see a, a lot of places do succession planning, but really what they're targeting is only leadership succession of Fortune 500 companies. What you need is someone who understands business succession or exit planning so that you get that holistic approach to all of those issues. They're intertwined, but if you come up with a great leadership succession plan and you haven't addressed the ownership succession plan, how well is that going to work? Not well is the correct answer. I should have brought candy bars, shouldn't have I? I did not. 
The goals. The goals are relatively simply stated. All that business succession planning is, is a strategy, right? Who here has a, a, a marketing strategy of some sorts and a marketing plan for their business, right? People have these things. Development plans for employees. Strategic plans for the business as a whole. All a good exit plan, business succession plan, is another strategic plan with action steps and identify what the issues are. That's it. And I get this, I used to do more estate planning, but I'd be meeting with a client and they'd give me the, well, if I die, I want, and I always said, really, you, you've got this if plan? Like, if you die, um, then you want this to happen? And, and I get it. It, it, it's challenging. But the other thing I tell them is, do your odds go up if you do an estate plan? Odds of dying go up if you do an estate plan. Like sometimes people think they do. They're like, oh, I'm going to do this estate plan. Now it means I'm going to die. Nope, you will die. But when you die, it's not going to be determined on whether you have a plan or not. And so a good business succession plan gets created early in the process. And all it does is it sets forth the strategy that will allow an owner to leave when they want, how they want, and for the price they want. It's a strategy you put in place now, and you don't, you don't need to like exit when you put together a plan. You still have that control. So it shouldn't stop you. You don't wait until you're ready to execute the exit to put together the plan. Does that make sense from a high level? All right, so we're going to go over the odds. Who agrees with this statement? Transferring your business is going to be hard. And I've got statistics and you got my presentation, so let's not cheat here, okay? I get to, I get to ask questions. What's one of the things that's going to make it hard? We talk first off about supply and demand. 63% of businesses are owned by baby boomers. What does that mean? How old is a baby boomer? Baby boomers, born in, yeah, I think, I think they'd say, uh, is it 46 to 64, is that right? I think that's what the official baby boomer is. How old is that person? 54 to 72, right? If we did a little bit of math. And so they talk about there's going to be $10 trillion either evaporating or transferring over the next five to 10 years as these baby boomers transition their businesses. So what's going to happen to supply and demand with regard to businesses? Anybody? Huge supply is going to hit the marketplace. What's going to happen to value? What, everybody lived through this, right? I mean, houses, anybody own a house? Like, live through this? Understand what's coming? Okay. So that's one of the factors that's going to make transferring your business hard. Particularly if you're transferring it to the external marketplace. Okay, if you keep it in the family, it's still hard because we've got a bunch of other factors. But if you have a plan that is transferred to the external market or an ESOP or a private equity or something that's external, valuations are going to go down over the next 10 years as supply increases immensely. Does that make sense? When we talk about really hard topics, we're going to talk about them at a level that I hope you can understand. So if there are any questions along the way, um, please ask them. These are all from uh, EPI, and they do surveys across the country. And they just completed a survey of Wisconsin. And our statistics aren't much different. If there's a difference, I'll highlight them for you. These are national statistics. In general, privately held business, 80 to 90 percent of their wealth is in their business. Because what do business owners do? If your company makes $250,000 a year, what do you do with that? You reinvest it, right? Maybe take a little bit out, maybe go on a vacation. But realistically, the wealth is oftentimes getting reinvested into the business. Do we have any financial planner type here? Investment advisors. There we go. Kate, if I came into you as a client and I said, I've got 80 to 90% of my wealth 
tucked into one closely held business, what, you, what would your risk analysis tell me? Yep, yep, so really high on the risk. The business owners, what happens if they fail? Okay, what happens if you fail in this transition? And you're one of these folks who has 80 to 90% of your wealth tied up in your business. How is the rest of life going to look for you? Walmart greeter. And, I, and I've got one bedroom in my basement, that's it, okay? So how important is it? Very. I gotta stop walking away. And yet, owners are not prepared. What do I mean by not prepared? 66% of owners are unfamiliar with the options. There are seven options in exiting a business. There's only seven. And each of them has pluses and minuses. And yet, two thirds haven't even like looked at the one page sheet that shows the seven options and what the pluses and minuses are. How hard is that? That's not hard. Stop over there, I, I'll give you the sheet, okay? You'll be like in the top one third of all business owners. If you at least understand what the options are and in general what the pluses and minuses are. How about a written plan, 8%. Less than one out of 10, right? We've all experienced that. I got a plan right up here. What happens to that plan when you're not here? Not so good, right? So it's gotta be a written plan. And this is 8% have a written plan. And I've seen some of their plans, right? They come in with a, a bar napkin and that's it. So like even the 8% oftentimes aren't sufficient. So we, we have a problem. Currently, this is not the future when there's more businesses for sale. This is current. This is of businesses actually listed with a broker on the internet, something like that. Three out of four do not sell. Is that a surprising statistic to anybody? So how do the family businesses do? This is the one we talked about already, right? You'd think family business, man, they should have a lot of success. I mean, it's my flesh and blood that should understand the values, has probably been involved in the business, sweeping up in the shop, or whatever it's been. Their entire life, they've been involved in that business. Like, boy, you'd think you'd have much better odds. You have a little bit better odds, right? But it's still 70% fail. 70% going from one generation to the next to people who like you raised should know what's going on. Still enormously high failure rate. And you look third generation, fourth generation, just worse odds, worse odds, worse odds. Next slide. Yes, Al, please. Correct, something. correct, yes. Yep, so I, I guess if you look at just the being able to transition, and I don't know what the number of years of continuation was, but maybe they don't last more than a year after the transition, or maybe they don't last after three years. So it's, it's a little better, but it's still not gonna be a good number. One of our last scary statistics is that when they go to a business owner, the, the, the 20 to 30 percent that actually sold their business, and they go, one year later, do you profoundly regret, so it's not just regret, the question was profoundly regret selling your business. 365 days later, three out of four say, yes, I profoundly regret that de decision to transfer that business. Why is that? Survey doesn't tell us. They didn't go on and ask why you regret it. So we got to guess. Anybody got a guess? Anybody see have 
I, I know there's some advisors in here as well as business owners. Anybody ever see a business owner who has a misconception about the value of their business? <laughs> maybe, maybe a couple times, like a misconception by a multiple of 10 or something, right? Like, hey, it's worth 20 million, and you're like, uh, maybe two, right? You get some of that. So I think that's certainly a factor. What other factors would produce profound regret a year later? Good. Guilt over what I would call legacy type factors, and one of them will certainly be sold it to an outside party, really cared about these people, and boy, they're not being treated the same way as they were under our regime, right? And not being treated the same way is oftentimes like out the door, right? And there are other legacy factors, right? Like, hey, the community. Run into a lot of clients who are very concerned not only about their employees, but it even extends to the community. Like, hey, the community is important to me. And what happens sometimes when somebody sells, doesn't think it through? Whoop, gone. Anything else? Yes? Yep, so that was, they haven't gotten emotionally ready and prepared for the third act, we call it. Okay? What are you going to do? Like, when I interview people, I ask that question. And I make them bring their spouse. You guys married? Yes? Yes? All right, perfect. So how do you think it plays out? I'm sitting down with Peter. Peter, do you, do you own the business? Uh, are you active in the business? OK, great. So can you pretend that you're not active? Because that's a lot of times how it works. And I go, Peter, all right, we're looking at transitioning the business. What are you going to do after you sell off the business? Work. Work? Where are you going to work? I'll be the janitor. At the OK, he's going to be the janitor. Sometimes what do you think I get for answers? I'm going to golf. Golf, fish. How about spend more time at home? Yep. How about that one for you? OK, because usually that's about the fourth <laughs> answer. It's like, hey, I'm going to spend more time at home. <laughs> eh, eh, right? That's, I get that every time. It's like, no, you're not. You're not messing up what I got going on here, OK? Nope. Your ass better find something else to do, OK? That's, <laughs> that's, that's what I get every time. So I think that's a great point, that failing to prepare. Um, oftentimes, we can guide people. Like, like they have additional interests that maybe they've been tucked away for a while. But you can usually redirect that passion. Because our, our business owners, like, they usually have a lot of energy and passion, and they want to like, accomplish stuff, right? And when they're not accomplishing stuff, Profound regret. Angelique? Yeah, that's very good. It's a, it's a grieving process. And I suppose it varies. But if, if you're prepared and you've thought about and you've planned for, in general, the grieving process is less. There's still a grieving process when it actually hits home. But if you can prepare yourself along the way, it generally works. Where I see the greatest grieving processes is when someone comes in and they just want to be a transaction. They're like, oh, found a buyer, got a letter in the mail, had a broker account, whatever it was. And yep, I decided to sell. And, and they don't think through what it's going to look like. And then they're out, and then they're in the 75%. Does that all make sense? Other thoughts, points? All right, so I think my next question is, how many of you are going to exit your business? It's the same question as, are you going to die, right? You will all exit. It is 100%. Everybody will. And it's just going to be a matter of whether you have control over that exit or somebody else does. Is it the court in probate court that has control over that exit and how it's going to go? OK. Is it your trustee? Is it, I don't know, kids fighting with each other, not knowing, thinking mom and dad had this plan. Nope, they had this plan. How's it going to go? Because you will exit. 
Remember that direct kind of asshole part? Like that's this slide. It will happen, 100%. Let's talk about the impact. What is the most important value in determining, determ what's the most important factor in determining the value of a business? Where are my accountants? Any? None? Oh, darn, I was hoping I'd be free reign to pick on accountants, but most important factor? Earnings. Earnings. Anybody else? Oh, did you look ahead at my slides? I think you're cheating. <laughs> or you've been at a presentation before, haven't you? Okay. Because what I hear a lot of times is I hear earnings. And I know you meant, hey, I assume it's transferable. I mean, I know you, you get that. And, and I, again, just picking on people a little bit. But I, I get that you understand that. But what, what typical business owners and a lot of times their advisors do not get is the number one factor is owner dependence. If you have a business that is dependent upon you, when something happens to you, the value goes away. It's only valuable, again, in a multiple. Let's go over the difference in values. It only has that high valuation if it can be successfully transferred. If you have a certain cash flow, okay, earnings, and it's dependent upon you, when I buy your business, I can't count on it going forward I'm not going to pay you under a multiple scheme. Okay, so like law firms, how much do they get bought for? Like nothing, okay, because <laughs> they're completely dependent upon the relationship, and when I'm gone, another attorney doesn't usually think they're just gonna walk in and take all those clients, because they'll just go find another attorney, right? So that's, an, that's an example of a heavily owner-dependent business that even if my earnings are a million dollars a year, they're not going to pay me based upon those earnings because they're going to go away. Let's do the math real quick. Assets, million bucks. Debt, 700,000. Uh, adjusted EBITDA, 400,000. EBITDA, right, we're kind of familiar with that. It's just like income, add back a couple things. All right, get to a cash flow number. Uh, forget about the working capital because I don't have a room full of accountants. I had to add that one for a room full of accountants because they. Screw up my example. So we make 400 grand. Is that a good business? That's a good business, right? Got some debt, got a million dollars worth of stuff. I don't care what's a machine shop, trucking company, whatever. That's kind of what it looks like. Question is going to be is what's the value of that business? If it's owner dependent and that I can't transfer those customers, those relationships, that income stream, the business is simply going to be worth an adjusted book value. What does that mean? Well, you sell off your crap, you pay your bank, and whatever's left over, that's what the value of your business is. If it could be transferred, now we start talking a multiple of earnings. Who here understands this multiple of earnings thing? All right, so we've got a handful. We'll kind of spend just a minute or two. This is what it is. If I walked up to you, my front row gentleman, yes. and I said, hey, I'm going to give you $400,000 a year. Okay. And, and this, yes, you'll take it, right? No, I'm going to make you pay for it. $400,000 a year. And I can virtually guarantee you that that $400,000 a year is going to continue for infinity. How much would you pay me? Let, me? let me start. Would you pay me three times? Would you pay me 1.2 million? Guaranteed. $400,000. I got to know. Anybody here? I got a few takers of that, right? I'll give you 1.2. I'm guaranteed $400,000 a year. It's going to beat the hell out of any annuity anybody can sell you, okay? I can tell you that right now, all right? So when you go talk to your financial, you're, they're not going to give you this, all right? Okay, you know, 1.2, give me 400 grand a year. It's not going to happen. And so you just, that's a three multiple. Okay, would you pay 1.2? Four multiple. Would you pay 1.6? Five multiple. Would you pay 2.0? Oh, 
And those are the rates of return. So where do most businesses land? You think somebody's going to pay like a 10 multiple? You think somebody's going to pay 4 million for that 400 grand? Be like, ooh, that's tough, man. You better have a really good guarantee. Because small businesses, are they subject to risk? Can you guarantee that next year you're going to make at least as much money as you did this year? So most businesses that are transferable will trade somewhere in that three to seven. Okay, a whole bunch of factors. That's where you go talk to the accountants, like, hey, quality of earnings, and you get ad backs because there's excessive owner salary, and you've had growth over the last few years, so it should be, like, a whole bunch of factors. But just as a general rule, and that's my purpose today, is to get you to basically understand how businesses are valued. Number one, you gotta make your business not dependent upon you. If it's dependent upon you, go to book value. Number two, if it's not dependent upon you, then you get some multiple. Whole bunch of industries, again, you can give them all kinds of data, right? Like, hey, boom, 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 tons of data as to three to seven, that's a humongous range, right? Your accountant can help you narrow that down, but the concept applies. And so let's see what happens. In our example, owner dependent, 300 grand is what they get for that business. Non-owner dependent, able to be transferred, 1.2 to 2.8. And again, depending on your business, you can just add zeros. Might be 3 million versus 12 million. Who wants the 300,000? Who wants the 1.2 to 2.8? Right? Relatively complicated subject. I hope I was able to convey the point, but are there any questions on that? And clarifications. I'd, I'd welcome, if you, if you disagree or think of something different, I would, I would welcome your comments. 300,000, if we went all the way back, we had a million dollars worth of assets, and we had $700,000 worth of debt. Is this different? Does this make sense? Okay, and I, again, I would, I would welcome additional comments because I'm a believer that everybody has ideas. So I'll give you mine first, okay? At the end of the day, how much you'll pay for that cash flow stream is dependent upon how much risk, you know, do you believe that it's going to continue? If you believe that it's going to continue or grow, you'll pay a higher multiple. If you're like, I'm not sure, you're going to pay a lower multiple. It's really about risk reduction and then what does the future look like. Those two factors would be a large impact. And then industry is probably a really big factor as well. Okay, there's some industries that there aren't a lot of buyers, just not going to value it very highly. So if you look at industries, they'll, they'll generally have a range, but then within that range, it's how do I reduce risk and how do I give people a belief that it's going to continue in the future or grow? Thoughts on that? Yes, or an additional question? If, if you're talking to the client and he's talking about wanting this ultimate objective, mm -hmm. how many years do you, do you rule of thumb recommend he prepares for that? That's a really good question, and that's at the end of my presentation. <laughs> yeah. Nice job. One guy that didn't read ahead. I appreciate that. Other thoughts, questions? Clarifications, any? Okay. I mean, again, from a... a, a, a a 5,000 foot level, that's how it works. All right. So the pieces of the plan, again, this can be a very high level as well. You're going to get more details from your speakers later today and this afternoon. But let's look at kind of, again, a high level. What are we trying to do? Trying to reduce risk? And we got to get rid of that owner dependence piece. Like that's what you have to do. You'll have a lot of other things to talk about, 
But in order to have something valuable to transfer to the kids, sell to a third party, whatever it is, you got to address these. Okay? It is not the kid's fault that value is deteriorated when the parents transfer the business if the parents haven't gone through making the business less dependent upon them and reducing the risk in the business. That is the parent's fault. Is that too strong? We talked a little bit about, but in my world, a business succession plan will always cover three pieces. It'll talk about ownership transition, it'll talk about leadership transition, and it'll have a contingency plan. Like, what happens if none of this planning crap ever comes to fruition and something bad happens? We gotta cover it. So we'll dig into those three. Here are my warnings. While it has been relatively well defined, um, if you look at, again, larger marketplaces, there are groups that have defined processes. There is a system that you can go through that has relatively predictable results. Like really smart people have designed them. Not me, okay? Like I steal other people's stuff at this point in life, all right? That's what I do. But there are principles that are universal, and there's a process that is well defined. The required steps for an individual business are always unique because there's people, and people are unique. But the process should be well defined and followed. First warning. Second warning. It is next to impossible for you to do it yourself. You can do parts, you can do pieces, but two things. Number one, you often last lack objectivity. Like we were talking about business owners, how they value their business, how they look at things. And that's not business owners, that's human beings. Like, I've never paid more than like $1,500 for a snowmobile in my life, okay? Like, like, I am the most frugal guy you've ever met, okay? Like, and so my kid, who's got this great job now as a mechanic, goes out and buys an $8,000 sled, right? And, and, and again, I lack objectivity. Like that, might be a, like, that might have more value to him as an individual at this point in his life and what he gets from it, but like from this guy's perspective, I'm like, what are you, crazy? I mean, like, I don't buy cars for $8,000. <laughs> and he bought a sled. And, and, and so that same kind of rose-colored glasses, lack of objectivity that we oftentimes have as parents, we bring that right over to our business. And an outside perspective sometimes is necessary. Not sometimes, like almost all the time. Other things, you generally have too much going on. So if you don't set time aside to, in general, get out of the environment and actually spend the time, it's not going to happen. It's always going to be on a do it tomorrow. And the third point is people have already made the mistakes that if you do it yourself, you're going to make. Why would you do that? Why would you not follow best practices and learn from other mistakes. You can create your own, and inevitably people do, but don't do the same mistakes that others have made. Get with somebody like the folks that are here today and learn from all the costly mistakes that others have made. So let's go into the three pieces, and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask some questions. I think you're gonna get more details um, from the rest of your presenters today, and we had some, again, great stuff this morning. Ownership transition, this is what you're thinking about. I'll maybe plug in a couple potential answers, but realistically, you have to figure it out. How will ownership be transferred? What are the pluses and minuses of each? I mentioned you can have all the pluses and minuses if you stop over there. I think there's a piece of paper over there that tells you. Are we doing this now or are we doing it later? There, are, there isn't always a right answer. Okay, sometimes for taxes, we gotta do some now, sometimes, okay, you got to think it through though. Now, later. 
Voting non-voting shares this is another piece that people oftentimes overlook. They're like, oh, do I give 5% to a kid? Do I give 5% to a kid? I got some tax stuff that I want to address. And what they don't think about is like, if it's economically based, it doesn't have to be voting shares that you give somebody or voting interest. doesn't matter what type of entity it is. You can start to split these things up. If you're concerned about transferring value to that next generation, you might not give them voting rights. Okay? If it's that leadership component and you do want them to control the board or make decisions for the company, now it might be voting. But split them up. Think about it. Don't let the fact that you only have voting shares in your company limit you. Like, you call me, like, a day later, you got voting and non-voting shares. Like, boop, done. Easy. So think about what you're trying to achieve. And that's an example of a tool. The fair but equal. What am I talking about there? Fair or equal, and or equal. When I meet with a typical mom and dad, and they have, they have five kids, what do I hear? I'm like, oh, I want to treat everybody equally. Is that always fair? Particularly when one, two, three of the kids are in the business and the others are not. It is simply, I got two kids in the business and I want to treat everybody equal, so I give everybody 20% in my estate plan. Mom and dad die, all kids got 20%, what happens? Come on, what happens? I get to see it all the time. Yep. Do the three have the same interest as the two that are in it? Absolutely not. In extreme cases, it's the three are like, hey, we want all the money in this. We're going to monetize it now. We're going to sell this thing. In less extreme cases, the two in the business are like, hey, we need to buy some new trucks, some new equipment, reinvest in the business, right? Because you, you do have to do some of it. I don't know if you got to get 90%, but you, you do have to reinvest. What are the three outsiders going to say? That seems like a great idea. Take my hundred grand and stuff it into a truck. Okay, yep, that's a wonderful idea. So interests quickly fail to align. Go back to, hey, I could do non-voting and voting shares. Or I've got something other than the business interest that I might be able to get to certain kids to treat them equal, but I'm not putting the kids involved in the business in a bad position. And then what's the most cost and tax effective tool? Um, again, it, when you're working with someone, it has to be a team. Taxes are a critical component of every plan. And numbers are like a critical component. So you like really need to have a smart accountant, CPA, to work with. Questions, thoughts? Um, these are really dealing with that 80 to 90 percent issue, right? It is a bad idea to have 80 to 90 percent of your net worth in a business. I don't care what business it is. And so, are there things that I can be doing now to begin diversifying out of this business? Because do bad things happen? Every day. And I won't get this stat completely correct. I think I will. Um, of the 100 largest businesses, in 1900, how many of them were still around in the year 2000, 100 years later? It's actually a little higher than I would have guessed, 8%. So, like, if the largest businesses with all of the resources and the greatest advisors and all that stuff can't make it 100 years, I don't know how you think, like, your business is going to be one that makes it 100 years. It could, right? But again, the odds are stacked against you. It's difficult. And so you might think about diversifying. Bad things do happen. Um, there are asset protection tools. And then the other biggest piece, this is where the, the, the financial planners, investment managers come into play, is there's oftentimes this, I'm not sure, okay? I, I don't want to certainly execute a plan, and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to live out the rest of my life. A financial planner being on that team should be able to help you. So ultimately, that's what 
The older generation, yes, they got some legacy things. They might have control issues. But also in the back of their mind, they're like, well, if I want to buy a place out in Denver, I'll be darned if I gave away this business and I don't have enough money to buy it in Denver, or I'm going to live to 100 and not be able to pay for health insurance. So you've got to, you've got to run through those pieces. So that's ownership. Leadership. Talked a lot about this, right? This is, this is the one that is probably most known, okay? It's, it's identifying current and future leaders, identifying skills gaps, defining a timeline, what's the role, responsibility, authority. Most are usually most familiar with this. Key employees, um, there are some tools. So we talked about how do we communicate to employees. I found that oftentimes communicating at least a contingency plan to employees. Like if something happens to me, here's what is going to happen. Or here's some additional money you're going to get if you stick around. Communicating some of that stuff is very helpful. Because your employees might not be asking you, but I can guarantee you, in the back of their mind, as you're adding gray hair, they're like, ooh, I don't know if they got the plan to Johnny yet. Or if Johnny's the right choice, or they have no plan at all, because the family's not interested. So you're going to have to, I think, communicate. And a lot of times, when you're incentivizing key employees to hang on, you can also handcuff them to make them stay. Uh, mission, vision, values, purpose, I bet we all have that. Clear strategic plan, and then insurance. Specifically, term insurance is oftentimes a very cheap for key people within the business. All right, we're rolling towards the end, and I want to leave a couple minutes for questions. The contingency plan piece. What happens to business if the unexpected occurs? If you have multiple family members, partners, up to date, buy, sell. What made sense 10 years ago probably doesn't make sense today. Particularly, you got a valuation methodology inside your buy, sell. Valuations change all the time. It's not going to be correct. Um, we address five Ds, but at the very minimum, you've got to get to death, disability, but you probably should cover divorce and disagreement and those pieces. And then in the contingency plan, you have to have a way to retain key employees. Okay? If you have a, a business and the, the, the founding individual passes away, what happens oftentimes with regard to key employees either during that family transition or some other transition. What happens to those key employees? Does your competitor go, oh, I'm sorry John died. I should certainly not seek to take his employees at this time. Right? And oftentimes, if you don't have those key people locked in, and it doesn't have to be hard. Okay, people will talk about SERP plans and non-qualified deferred comp plans. They're relatively hard. You can have a simple uh, plan that goes, hey, if, 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 if something happens to me, I've got a term life insurance policy that says, if you stick around for a year, you're going to get a 50% bonus. Whatever your wages, I'm going to pay you an extra 50%, as long as you stick around for 12 months. Stick around for 18 months, I'll give you another 50%. Do you think people are more prone to go, nah, I'm not going to take that offer with the other. I'll still be there a year and a half from now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get paid double over the next 18 months. Like, I'll take that deal. Your people will stay. And what does that allow? It allows you to execute, develop that plan a little more, and not have to deal with the death spiral that begins when key employees get taken. Um, we talked about advisory board. Um, Revocable trust, like every business owner should have a revocable trust, not a will-based plan. I hope that's basic. If you don't understand that, talk to your attorney. Um, and then the ownership interests have to be in the trust. Okay, we could go over all the reasons why you need a trust. Trust me, you need a trust. Um, and then you got to fund it, though. The number of businesses that don't have their shares actually in the trust are relatively high. And then you have to have some provisions. Usually the way it works with lawyers, you got like a state planner and you got the business guy. And the estate planner doesn't look at your business any differently than he does IBM stock. And so your estate plan, if you looked at it, it'll probably be like, IBM stock's treated the same way as my closely held business. I see those plans every day. 
All right. Overview of the process. Inevitably, the advisor has to gather data, ask a bunch of questions, i.e., gather more data, analyze the information. And then oftentimes there's a loop. Three goes back to one, come through three, one, three, one, three, one. Okay, so you have a number of meetings. The meetings could take months, the meetings could take years, depending upon the dynamics of the business, particularly in family businesses. Ultimately, though, you've got to get to a prioritized action plan. Okay, when you're putting together a succession plan, at the end of the day, after all of the talk, you have to have a plan that lists all the things that have to be accomplished and when they need to be accomplished and by who they need to be accomplished. The number of plans that I've seen are just talk, 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 talk. Like, it's good to talk, but at the end of the day, you have to have a plan. And then you have to go and execute that plan. We break everything down into 90-minute sprints, or 90-day. I wish we could do 90 minutes. 90-day sprints. So you're like, hey, for this quarter, all you got to do is get the buy-sell agreement updated. For this quarter, all you got to do is meet with your financial planner and run a Monte Carlo analysis to make sure that you have some certainty of what you need. All you got to do for this quarter is this piece. Because if I give a business owner an action plan and there's 12 things on it that need to be accomplished, like how many of them are going to get accomplished if I don't break it down into pieces? Probably like none. Maybe one because they're like, oh yeah, we really need this. But otherwise, so you got you to break it down. And, and just you can do it for yourself if your advisor does it. Just one, two, that's it. One, two, a quarter. Repeat. And then on an annual basis, you look at the plan and you go, does it still make sense? Did something change? Are valuations of the company through the roof gone down? Lost key employees? How do, we, how do we tweak it? And then once it's tweaked, you revise that action plan, and you just move through your sprints again. Does that make sense? All right, to answer the question, when to start? Anybody got any thoughts? I have minimums, and I'm going to give them to you. I like, I think, I think Jason Mandy, right, said, like, start right away. Like, like, at the, like start now. And you certainly start on the conversation. Um, but in my opinion, if it's, if, if, if it's going to be an external sale, if, if you come to the family business is not going to transfer to the next generation, we're going to ultimately sell it and reallocate those resources somewhere else, you need at least three years. Yeah, you can have more, but you need at least three years of working closely with the attorney and the accountant to prep this thing for sale so that you can maximize the value of it. Like, can you sell a business in six months? Like, if you call me up, I can, I, we, we can get it done in six months. But you're not going to get the same amount of value as if you plan for it. And it usually takes three years for your planning to flow through to the numbers so that the external marketplace is going to pay you a higher multiple. Does that make sense? How about if it's internal? Either a family transfer or maybe you got a management team that's going to be a part of it. Sometimes that happens. How long is that going to take? In general, it's going to take longer. Why does it take longer? A, there's a lot more stuff to deal with, right? There's all these family dynamics. But then also, oftentimes, they don't have, like, an external buyer. Okay, maybe it's private equity. They got the money sitting in the bank. Like, boom, here's your money. Oftentimes, management team or next generation doesn't have all that wealth to just take out mom and dad or the group. And so you've got you've to develop plans so that they take, off, they take a bite of the elephant, just a little bit at a time. So it usually takes longer to implement. Questions? We've probably got time for like two or three. Anyone? That either means nobody was paying attention or I was just so clear that
Yep. So, and I probably will do it the other way, right? Because I'm an attorney, so I look at all the reasons they're not transferable. Okay. So, high customer concentration. That makes a much less transferable business than diversified. Okay. Um, I'll call them job shops, but but businesses that don't sell things on contracts or don't have repeatable customer bases. That makes it more difficult. Um, where you have Oftentimes it's the owner who is like the, the key relationship with customers or vendors or something like that. Um, they, they just have something they control. It could be that customer base. Nobody else controls that customer base. Could be key vendors. Um, could be key knowledge. Okay, like, hey, I'm, I'm the only guy who knows how to do this part of the process. Um, it's really any, any bottleneck, okay, that that one individual has, um, and then some external factors like um, client diversification and contracts and repeatable business and that kind of stuff. Yeah, other thoughts that I? Yeah, the, you know, you, you talk about the timeline to sell the business. Having those conversations early gives you three years or five years to put that in place and make those changes to make it more transferable. Correct, correct. I, the point is, is is you need that time. So mine were minimums, right? Like a client I'm working with right now, they have 60% customer concentration in a really good client. Like, am I going to tell them to just eliminate that client? No, okay, but they're going to figure out a way to, to diversify and grow outside of that client so that the customer concentration problem reduces and their value goes up. Um, I bet I'm just about out. Any last question? That was a good one. What happens when, in a family business, so often a small family business, it's multiple owners, and the triggering events, you mentioned the three to five triggering D events, what happens if one owner doesn't want what the other two want, and it's not a triggering event, or does that make it a triggering event? Okay, that's a really good, complex question, okay. <laughs> In general, okay, and, and maybe we're talking about a, a buy-sell agreement or just a, a plan in general. So um, there are things that a majority control, and there are things that have to be unanimous in a business. For one individual to sell their shares, in general, that kind of has to be unanimous. Like two of them can't usually just take them, okay? There are tools, okay, that I can squeeze minority shareholders with and eliminate them, okay? Like, but you don't want to do that in a family business, all right, okay? Um, those are different, hostile takeover type stuff, okay? <laughs> like, we don't want to do that. Um, non yes, non-hostile. Um, in general, it's A, it's going to take a process. So, so like, a lot of the consultants are, are driving towards that. You're just going to have to have communications because oftentimes you've got to get to unanimous. And you might not get all the way over to where the two want, you might have to move the two and move the one and move the two and move the one and move the two and move the one, but I'd rather have a plan that addresses 70% of the issues and leave the 30% where you disagree, because that's usually it. There's a point at which there's disagreement, but the overall concept of wanting survival of the business, everybody agrees upon. So you can usually get to mutual, but it is challenging. It's part of the challenge in, in small business is that everybody doesn't agree and everybody doesn't see it the same way, and, and especially in the family business. And then sometimes it's a majority issue, and two out of three, that's the way it's going. But oftentimes it's a unanimous decision, and now you've got to use some sort of process to bring the sides together and find commonality and develop a plan around that commonality. And that was a horse crap answer, but sorry. That's what it is. It's like, I can't go, it's A on that one. It's like, you got to work through it. All right, I'm over time. And, and, and Kevin, you'll be around during the break if folks have additional yes. questions. Yes. Okay, Kevin Eisman, Epiphany Law, please give him a hand. Thank you so much, Kevin. We'll, we will reconvene, we'll reconvene in 10 minutes, but if you do have questions for Kevin, he'll be around. <laughs>